brother. Praise the Lord. I felt led to return to this Scripture. Uh, this is in prayer this morning. This is where the Lord wanted me to go back. And, and uh, so I'm just going to go back here and share a little bit more about this principle of watching and praying. Yeah. <coughs> watching and praying. <coughs> Never have I seen... And I, and I think, as best as my memory recollects, never have I seen a time in which people are, wow, these days are exposing. Just this past week, two, two ministers I knew personally and respected, fallen into sin, inappropriate conduct towards a woman, and... It's tragic. And it's happening all across our nation. Happening again and again and again. These days, if you can fall, you will fall. Judas will never betray Christ in eternity. He'll do it here. He'll do it here. If you can fall, you will fall in this life. Amen. And uh, I, I just I want to revisit. I want to talk a little bit more about it. Matthew 26 and 41. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation... Spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Would you say amen to God's Word? You may be seated this evening. <clears throat> wanted to spend just a little bit more time here, the Lord's will, and share some more things and talk about this passage with us here tonight. I, I, I say that I visit this whole... Um, context and this place in Scripture, the event upon which these, the occasion, I should say, in which these words were uttered to the apostles of Jesus Christ. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The Spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. It's hallowed ground. The Garden of Gethsemane is one of the, uh, it's, it's, it's an event that I cannot grasp the depth of it. I don't think there's anybody that can. I'm going to say something here tonight. I don't want you to take me the wrong way, but I, I want to make a statement here. I think <clears throat> there may be certain events and things that took place in the Bible that uh, it may be possible to, in some measure, to do some things with those, or things that have happened, to, events that have happened common to man. And um, you may enact a drama. You may put on some play and reenact some of those events. You may reenact Daniel in the lion's den, though I doubt you'll feel quite like he felt. But there may be some things you may put on the stage play. But I I really believe, this is for me personally, that we often do injustice when we try to reenact the events in the life of Christ. When you try to, to reenact and make some drama about the garden of it, you can't capture it. And sometimes you end up putting a picture in people's mind that's wholly inadequate and wholly less than what was actually there. This is hallowed ground. This is our Savior. This is our, our God. This is our King who is in a battle for our salvation. Who is in a battle for that's against all the powers of darkness that have come against Him. And you and I can't fathom that. I'm just telling you that there's no way to portray that. The words that are given to us in Scripture are, are there and they're the inspired words. And yet, and yet to try to take that and put that in some kind of drama form. I'm not saying that to be critical. I'm just telling you that uh, you cannot reenact the life of Jesus Christ. That's just the way it is. Because uh, although you may give some kind of physical portrait, you're not going to ever again bring together heaven and hell in such a conflict like it was brought together. The spiritual forces that were in conflict in that event and that occasion. The darkness of the hour. Jesus said it was the power of darkness and the hour of darkness. It was a time in which He was coming to be lifted up from the earth and a time in which the Prince of the world was under judgment. And, and, and I'm telling you that not only just the, the hordes of 
of hell, if I can use it that way, or the devil's kingdom, but also the angels of heaven, the good angels that were, were, were on standby, if you will, present to watch, waiting. Uh, Jesus said, I could have had more than 12 legions of angels if I wanted them. One of those angels was sent to help him and strengthen him in the garden of Gethsemane. And I just think about it that sometimes uh, when we try to, to, to put it in some kind of drama form, we, we end up actually belittling it rather than expressing it as it is. There's some things uh, we just need to leave to the Word of God, the inspiration of the Spirit, and allow the Holy Spirit to impress it into our life by the inspired Word of God Almighty and the preaching of the Gospel. And I, I say that to say that as I enter and I, I share with you some things about this passage tonight, I want you to know I seek to tread lightly. I, I, it's, it's hallowed ground, I'm telling you. I don't know how else to say it, but this is our Savior and our King. And it, and, and, and the darkest hour that He would probably ever experience except for that dark hour on the cross and those three hours of darkness. But prior to the cross, this would be His darkest and most difficult hour in His life. And, I, and, and yet He must tread that way alone. And, I, and so, But in that context, as we enter on it, I want us to take a little bit and talk about this verse of Scripture again. First of all, I'm going to talk again about this idea of temptation. The Bible says, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. Temptation comes to every man. There's no man exempt from it. But the Bible indicates here there's a way to overcome it. To watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. What is it? I'm going to talk a little bit about this business and just the, some general characteristics of temptation and then about the specific temptation that was taking place in the occasion in which these words were uttered in the life of Jesus Christ. But, but generally speaking, the idea of temptation, if you will, it's number one, it's a very simple, it's a proposition to turn away from your present course. Uh, Jesus was on a course uh, back in the garlic or in the Gospel of Luke. He came off the Mount of Transfiguration. And the Bible said, He set His face to go unto Jerusalem. Jesus has determined this. When He was on the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses and Elijah spoke to Him of His passion. They spoke to Him of the Exodus, the means by which He would leave this world. And they spoke to Him, which would include His death, His resurrection, His ascension. And they talked to Him about that. And so that Jesus Christ is now, He's on His way. He has been built for Jerusalem. He knows that he goes there. He's walking into the enemy's lair. He knows he's walking into opposition. He's walking into a place where folks are standing against him. None understands. The, dis uh, the disciples are following. And the Bible says that they follow him. They're amazed uh, in the way as they see his determination. And he's going forth unto Jerusalem. But he's on a course. Uh, and I understand, if I understand anything about the devil, is he wants to get Jesus off course. Uh, that's what Temptation is all about. It's about getting you off course. You've got a place you're headed towards. We've got a goal we want to reach. We've got a vision we want to see fulfilled and accomplish. We've got a purpose for which God has given to us in this world. This church has a specific design and a specific goal and a purpose. We want to reach our neighborhood. We want to have a, an oasis here. We want to be able to be a, 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 an oasis for those who are weary of sin and thirsty for righteousness. Righteousness. We want to be a place where we're salt and light, where we can reach out and touch the lives of other people. And I'm telling you right now, if the devil wants us off course, he'd like us to get on some other subject. He'd like us to get in battle in some political arena. He'd like us to get in battle in some social agenda. He'd like for us to get entangled in some kind of other conflict. Anything to get us off of the course that God has designed for us to follow. Second thing about temptation, you need to understand about it that temptation is an attack. And it is an attack bent on destroying you. The devil doesn't want to tempt you to play games with you. The devil's not tempting you just so he can uh, uh, entertain himself. The devil is tempting you because he is bent on destroying you. Too many times we do not see that. We play around with it. We just kind of uh, play games. Well, it's not a big deal. Oh, well, you know, I kind of messed up. Oh, well, no big deal. Folks, forgave me. I'm going on. It's not really a big deal. It is a big deal. I'm telling you right now that you, if you fail once, you can fall twice. 
The devil is bent on destroying your soul. He doesn't play games. He's out for keeps. And we need to understand that. I've got an enemy. And that enemy is tempting me. Even when you're there, the, the other side, when you have two countries at war, they're always looking for people who will be counterfeits. They're looking for people who will turn coat on their nation and be spies. And, and then we're looking for those who will uh, uh, turn from their, their nation and turn over to the other side. That's the devil. He's always looking to enlist people out of God's army and pull them over to his side. But not because he loves you. The devil doesn't care for you. He has no interest in your salvation. His only interest is in fulfilling his own selfish objective in this world. <clears throat> Thirdly, it's a test of your faith and convictions. And thus it's a revealer of your character. Temptation will tell what you are. It's a test. Simply put, it's a test. It is there to discover if you are who you say you are. If you're really true. You've made claims, you've made a confession, you've made a profession. You went to church. You do this, you do that. You claim to be filled with the Spirit. You're sanctified, you're saved. You're a Christian. You're on your way to hell. Isn't it interesting sometimes after our biggest brags come our biggest test? <laughs> Amen. Uh, it becomes our biggest trials because we make our boast. You know, I'm going to make it and praise the Lord. I'm not, I'm going to be strong. And you find out, my, I'm telling you, the, the, the uh, trouble is unleashed on you the very next day. But understand that it is this idea of a test of your faith. It's going to see whether you really believe in God. Will the things that you profess, are they convictions or are they preferences? Are there things that you've really settled and established in your heart and mind that they are non-negotiable? You're going to live by these. Doesn't matter who, what anybody else says or what anybody else does. This is who you are. It doesn't matter if you're in the store, if you're in your house, if you're down the road somewhere, if you're in the, uh, 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 in the ballpark. It doesn't matter where you're at. You're going to be who you are or who God has made you wherever you're at. That's right. I can tell you that your trials will reveal your character. Right. You put you in the pressure, put you in the box, and nothing reveals more the character of Jesus Christ than the test that took place in the garden of Gethsemane. In the garden of Gethsemane, the devil tried to get him off track and veer him apart from the cross, but he stayed the course. In the garden of Gethsemane, the devil was bent on destroying him and bring another death to him and take him out before he can ever reach the cross of Golgotha's hill. The devil was there and it was a test. And I'm telling you, our Lord passed with flying collars. He was still Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. He didn't lose his demeanor. He didn't lose his character. He didn't lose his integrity. Even though everybody forsook him. Even though his disciples would not watch with him. Though he stood it alone. He came to them. He didn't get all angry and blow out at him. He didn't get all upset and push them aside because they didn't stand with him. No, sir. He warned them and he prayed for them. And he overcame by the power of the Holy Ghost. And I'm here to tell you that it's in the Garden of Gethsemane as well that we see that our Lord is true to His purpose on this earth. Yes. And these days, I'm watching temptations discover who people are. As I shared with you, just sad. I, I'm not go. I can't go into it, but I'm just. It's sad. It's tragic. It's terrible. And I'm telling you that even sometimes in a fall and when men turn back to God, it does reveal who men are and what's really there in their character. Please understand that the trials of this life will expose you. They will reveal your nature. They'll reveal your character. They'll reveal your shortcomings. They'll reveal who you are. They'll reveal your strengths and your weaknesses. They'll reveal whether you're true or false. They'll reveal whether you are going to stay the course or whether you can be detoured from the course. That is the purpose, or at least some of the purposes of temptation. But the very fact that we're being tempted is that we're on a course for glory and we're headed there. We've got an enemy that is called the devil and we put our faith in God and we've made our confession and so the devil says I'm going to get them off course I'm going to destroy them and I'm going to prove that they're not the people that they say that they are Amen. 
Now in this context, I want you to notice three things about the temptation that came to the Lord Jesus Christ. Number one, I believe this, and I believe the context bears this out, that it came to Him unexpectedly. We say, well, the Lord knew everything. As God, that's true, but as man, not true. As man, He did not know everything. As man, He had to learn. As man, He had to grow. He came into this world, He had to study the Bible. He had to memorize Scripture. He didn't know it automatically. He had to grow up with it, Brother John. He read it daily. He read the Word of God. He memorized the Word of God. He learned. He prayed. He spent time. He listened to the Father. He said, the things the Father speaks to me, that's what I tell. Whatever the Father tells me to do, that's what I'm going to do. And there are just things that came. And this one, it appears because here's Jesus. He's going along. And He's going to the Garden of Gethsemane. And He's just on the way. He knows what's coming. But then He just tells His apostles, said, I want you to stay here. I'm just going to go down the road and pray. And he took Peter, James, and John. But after he separated Peter, James, and John from the rest of the uh, group, the other eight, uh, then we found out the Bible said it was like all of a sudden it was there. And he said, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling exceeding sorrowful even unto death. It's just him now, Peter, James, and John. And he, this thing has come upon him. And it's, it appears that he's sideswiped. Uh, and the enemy has come and brought a barrage against the King of Glory that he did not expect. He probably expected the battle on the cross to be uh, there would be the great battle but here it would hit him and I'm telling you that's oftentimes how the temptation will come it will come to us unexpectedly the one that will get us the one that will often destroy us is the one we weren't looking for we didn't expect it to come from that arena we thought it would come over yonder and it came here we thought it would come tomorrow and it came today we thought it would come in our later years it came in our early years we thought it would come from this person it came from another person and I'm telling you the devil will plan an attack when you are least expected. That's the tactics of warfare. Hit the enemy where they don't expect you to attack. Amen. Secondly, the temptation created an, an, an area of uncertainty. Here is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He goes into that garden and he begins to pray. He cries to the Lord God and he says, Father, take this cup and another verse or another, another gospel says, Lord, let this hour pass from me. This hour, this cup, let it pass from me. Right here in the garden, I'm having a tough time. Lord, I feel as I can die right now, Father. Help me now. And then the Bible says he utters these words that have been repeated over and over and over. Nevertheless, Father, not my will, but thine be done. There's only one reason you make that statement. And that is there is an uncertainty as to the Father's will. Something has come unexpected and you are not certain the direction that you need to take. You're not certain where it's going to end up. You feel something. You feel where you need to go. You know what God's called you to do. You know what you need to do. But something has entered into the picture you didn't think was going to come into the picture. Something's interrupted the plan. Something's interrupted the path here. And now you don't know what to do exactly with the interruption. You believe it needs to be removed. You believe you can't deal with this. And what you need to deal with later as well. And so that, based on what he said, he said, I want to take away. God, take this thing away. Take it away from me. But, Lord, if I'm not seeing it right, if there's something that's not there, not my will, but your will be done. That indicates, Father, I'm uncertain here. There's something I'm not sure about. Oh, that's the way it is. As a man, he must rely on the Holy Spirit. As a man, the Father will allow the cloud of darkness to enshroud him for a time. And so that Jesus himself must pray according to the wisdom that he has and then ask God and wait on God until he is certain that the Father has given him the direction that he needs. Too many times when it comes to us and in the uncertainty is when we lose it. We barge ahead and do our own thing. We barge ahead and push on and go some way we shouldn't go. And we, we take it because something has stepped in. We think, oh, this is the way I need to go and forget what God's told me all along. Well, let's just trash the cross and get rid of it. Here's another way because this has come and it must be God's will, you know, because I'm feeling it. No, just because you're feeling it doesn't mean it's God's will. 
No. So what do you do? You know the vision God's given. You know the will that God's determined. You know what has been certain. He knows what he's been convinced of. It's been there. He has told it to his disciples. He's expressed it again and again. It was talked about on the Mount of Transfiguration. He says, for this purpose I have come into the world. He came. He's already announced it. He's told it. That's what the fathers want. But now something has entered into the picture that's put him off track. What's he going to do about it? Lord, I don't know what to do here. This thing has come to me. Help me out and show me. Lord, I can't bear this and the cross too. What is your will, Father? I need deliverance. I need deliverance, Father. But if you want me to bear it, I know you'll help me to bear it. But I think at the same time, it was this. At the same time, Father, if I bear this thing, you've got to show it to me. I want your will to be done and you're going to have to help me. He was that kind of confidence between him and the Father. And I'm going to tell you something right now. If you don't have a good, strong relationship with the Father, that kind of temptation will tear you apart. Come on, brother. Go ahead. You put you in a quandary of uncertainty and your faith is weak. I'm telling you right now, that's where we tend to lean to the flesh and go and do our own thing right. and lean to our own understanding. The third thing was that it was an unrelenting trial. It first of all, it was unexpected. It brought uncertainty and it was unrelenting. What do I mean by that? Jesus goes... The Bible said that he, he left to three. He said, watch with me. One, one, one gospel writer says, pray with me. Another one says, watch with me. And, uh, and then he goes on. And, and Luke, I believe, records that he kneeled. Matthew and Mark. Matthew records that he fell on his face. Another one just says he fell. Well, they probably fell first to his knees. That would be what Luke indicates. And that he kneeled and then finally he just fell on to his whole face. Jesus is laying prostrate. I'd like you to get, that's why I'm saying we're talking about hallowed ground. I'm talking about the King of glory laying on his belly, face down, face in the dirt, crying for his very life. He knows what is come. And I'm telling you, all, all of the powers of darkness bringing their power to bear against the King of glory. There is the unexpectancy of it. There is the sense of the, of the uncertainty in the moment which way to go. Father, not my will, but your will be done. But then there's un unrelenting attack. He prays and it appears he gets relief. Yeah. So he goes over to the apostles. Fellows, couldn't you watch with me for an hour? Peter, just but one hour couldn't you state me? And then you know what happens? He turns and goes again. Praying the same prayer. If you've ever been in a battle for your life, if you've ever been in a battle for your soul and your salvation, I can tell you, or a very deep and tough trial, you go and you pray, you get relief, you, you get you get a sense of peace that overcomes you, and, and you go away, and you walk on, praise the Lord, I got the victory. And, and you know what, before you know it, an attack comes down on top of your head again, and there it is, pouring down over top of you, and you feel it, and it's draining you, and you, and, and, and you go right back and do what Jesus does. You've got to go back and you've got to pray again. And he prayed the second time. And he found peace. He found release. An angel comes and strengthens him. He goes back and he goes back to talk to the apostles. He finds him sleeping again. And brother, he comes on him a third time. And he's got to go back and he prays. And the Bible says he's in such an agony that he prays until his sweat becomes as great drops of blood. I don't think it was actual blood. You can say what you want to if it does or not, but that's really not the point. The Bible says, as it were, great drops of blood but you can hear him there in the agony and it must have been a lot of groaning but you can hear the drops of sweat as they dropped it's night time my friend it's night time he's in there in the darkness they cannot see but they can hear the groan and the agony and they can hear the sweat as it drops as a thick a thick a, a, a drop of blood dropping in the dirt making that little thud and they can hear it falling up the Savior's brow. And I'm here to tell you right now, the enemy will be unrelenting in his attack and you're going to have to learn to pray until you get the victory. Amen. We must understand that we survive by the mercy and the grace of God. Because if the devil had his way, it would be utter destruction. But this unrelenting attack so that even the King of glory, whose prayers are always answered, Jesus never prayed an unanswered prayer. Right. Amen. He did not know what it was to pray and the Father not hear Him. Father always heard the Son. Always listened to the Son. But this time, it will take Him praying three 
times until finally the attack is lifted. But what encouragement for you and I from when we've had to pray again and again. We'll talk about it later. I want to talk a little bit about this watching. That's the temptation. I want to talk a little bit about this business of watching. We know what it is to watch. It's to be alert, to be careful. You know, we use it all the time. We get, man, people come to visit my house and they leave at night time. I'll tell them, watch for the deer. Watch for the deer. You, because you're going down the road at night around here in the country roads. They come out of nowhere. You have to be alert. You have to stay awake. You have to keep scanning the horizon. Always watching for them two little eyeballs sticking out, you know, two little bright lights that you can see popping out. Some little odd form beside the road, whatever it is. And even then sometimes it can catch you unaware. But we use it. You're going to do something. Watch yourself. Be careful. Stay alert. Stay awake. That's the idea. We understand it. Now why is that? Because, understand this, you and I, there's a possibility in our life that we can fail. There's no reason to tell us to watch unless you and I can be overtaken by temptation. Watch for it. And that means be alert to it. Be awake to it. Be apprised of it. Be aware that there is danger in your world. We know the devices of the enemy. And, And there becomes this business that I know that I, I live in a world of danger. How much often we see it in the animal kingdom. We see the herds. We see them eat a little bit, that head perking up. Smelling the wind. See if they can smell what comes by. Sniffing the wind. A movement in the grass that's abnormal. Some noise that's moved. They're alert. Their ears are pricked up at it. Why? Because their life depends on it. I'm going to tell you something right now. Temptation will kill you if you give in to it. Sin is what kills, but temptation is the path to sin. Mm -hmm. And understand that there's not one person sitting in this church tonight that can say, I'm guaranteed heaven and I can never fall. Until you breathe your last breath, my friend, the enemy can destroy you. He can take you out. There is danger in your world. But too many times we are nonchalant about our salvation. Too many times we are careless and negligent as to our spiritual disciplines and as to the things that keep us in the, in the groove and keep us where we ought to be. And too many times we just let things go and let things go and let things go and let things go. And we all oh, get to it. I'll get to it. There comes a time you wake up and you're like a Samson and the Spirit of the Lord's left you and you think you got it and you don't have it anymore. You go to reach out for it and it's not there. You go to church and you feel like the feeling's going to be there and the feeling's not there. You go to pray and it's as dead as dead can be. The heavens are brass and it's shut up. It's because you let it go and you let it go and you let it go and pretty soon it's destroyed you. Understand that you and I, that's why we've got to watch. We're in a battle. When in, in, the, in one uh, 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 nation out there any any army that is on the field, uh, you have watchers. Uh, you put men out there, soldiers that are on the guard. Uh, you have guard You don't ever make a camp and not put out men to guard the camp and to watch for signs of the enemy. You're a fool if you do it. You must always look. You must always watch. And I'm here to tell you, you've got to be a guardian by the help and grace of God over the enemy of your soul. You've got to guard your life and not neglect your salvation. You are in a world that is fraught with danger. You must realize that there's a duty that you and I have got to perform. Look, we've got a church to maintain. We've got a faith to keep. We've got a course to run. We've got a fight to fight. Amen. We have got a battle to fight. We have got a character to maintain. We have got the name of Jesus Christ to exalt and to herald and to lift up in this world. You and I have got treasures in this church. We've got treasures in our friendships. We've got treasures in the presence of the Holy Ghost among us. We've got treasures in having the preached word. We've got treasures in ministries that God has allowed us to have and reaching out to others. We have got things that in this church 
church uh, that you and I have got to guard over and the devil would like to steal them one by one. He'd like to take them out and strip them away from us one by one. Uh, all it takes is a little unfaithfulness. All it takes is a little bit of neglect. Uh, all it takes is a little bit of carelessness uh, and things can be lost. Uh, I'm telling you there have been more people that have died uh, and lost their salvation over neglect uh, than ever lost it uh, over some great horrible sin. Uh, no, just simply being careless uh, in the face of the enemy. Amen. Not watching. There's a job to do. And you know, there's, there's things that we constantly do in this business of watching. You put, one of the things we do is we, 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 we put safeguards in there. We, we, we build habits. We, we, we make, build certain walls. We, we make certain, place certain restraints on ourselves. Because we know the danger we can get ourselves into. I'm going to tell you right now. In this culture, marriages don't have much hope of survival. Especially apart from Jesus Christ. There are even folks in the church and their marriages are falling apart. Come on. And you find ministers are falling into sin. And it always starts with a little bit of counsel. A little whimpering and whining from someone. And for you know it, the pastor is counseling this woman over marriage and doing it apart from his wife. And a little conversation, a little counsel leads to a second meeting and a third meeting. Before you know it, it's become a bit more intimate. Before you know it, the pastor's more understanding than her husband. Before you know it, she's looking to pastor as a savior, to pastor. Oh, if my husband were like that, and comparisons are being made. And before you know it, two homes are wrecked. But had safeguards been placed there, first of all, we would have never went down some of those roads that led to destruction. There's some temptations can be avoided because you just put safeguards in place. You build some walls and say, we're not going outside this area. We're not tramp this court. There will be no emails with a female that my wife does not see and read. There will be no private conversations with a man, another man's wife unless my, my wife must only be present or there must be another witness there to safeguard. That's safeguard. That's not foolishness. That's watchfulness. That's being careful because there are temptations that can overtake our lives. Amen. So we pray. We study. We preach. And sometimes, yes, we may preach a doctrinal message or we, we defend or we do an apologetics. It's not because... We're trying to just thump an old drum. It's not because we're trying to just beat a dead horse. It's because I'm telling you that our doctrines can be taken from us. Our faith can be stripped from us. And if we don't constantly teach it, it will soon be forgotten. Because the overwhelming majority, how many churches today are closing their doors? Economically. Today, brother, just share with me about churches, particular state that uh, ministers are having to work and work. Even some ministers working on Sunday so that they can meet uh, necessities. Things that are taking place w- w- there within the ranks and, 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 and happening. I'm telling you right now, church, please understand. We say it, we say it, we say it. Oh yeah, the Lord's coming soon. Oh yeah, we're in the end times. We don't even know what we're saying sometimes. Because I'm telling you, the end times are not good times. The end times are not fun times. The end times are not easy times. The end times are some of the most intense times of trial that men have ever uh, undergone. And they're some of the last days that will test me. And that's why the Lord says, especially in that last hour, pray, watch and pray, watch and pray, watch and pray that you can be counted worthy to escape the things that are coming upon the face of this earth. And the only way that I can be worthy to escape the great temptation is that I must overcome the present temptation in which I'm in now. There is an hour of temptation that's coming upon all the earth to try them to dwell upon the earth. And the only way I will escape that hour of temptation is that I overcome it now. And that comes by watching and praying. 
I'm going to tell you right now, you don't watch over your job, you'll lose it. You don't watch over your marriage, you'll lose it. You don't watch over your family, you'll lose it. You don't watch over your church, you'll lose it. It doesn't matter what you have. Neglect it and you'll lose it. That's just the nature of the world we're in, church. Thirdly, as I said, we've got a destiny to go to. I'm going somewhere. I'm headed to glory. I'm headed to heaven. I'm, I'm headed to beyond that to the new Jerusalem is my final destiny that I'm looking for. Peter said we look for in a place where in dwells righteousness. We look for a place where in dwells righteousness. Consequently, the place that is going to be on this earth eternally, please understand that. The millennium is going to be a time in which Jesus rules with a rod of iron. Yes. That means inflexible justice. There's no flexibility in a rod. It's not a reed. It's a rod. It's not a rod of an almond tree. It's a rod of iron. It doesn't bend. Light is coming. Oh, I don't believe in all that capital punishment. You won't like the millennium because it will be enacted. If there is any adulterer in the millennial reign, he will or she will be stoned. Right. If there is a man or woman who commits murder, they will be executed. Right. If there is a son who becomes rebellious, an adult son who's rejected all discipline, he's become a louse, he's become lazy, he's become a, a slouch to society. Mother and father will be the first ones to witness against him. They will take that son, they will deliver them up to the judges, and he will be executed. Oh, we just think, you need to see, we read that sometimes today. People read it, oh, how barbaric. It's not an ounce of barbarism. I'll tell you what's barbaric. A children or a society in which young people are running over and have no respect for the ancients, no honor, no respect for those that are around. That's barbaric. What's barbarism? And now the idea is that, you know, you, you, you don't discipline. There's no sense of training of your children anymore whatsoever. And some folks were sharing with me today this, at the, how, the, how the children are being trained today. It's ridiculous. It's absurd. And I can tell you, it's not working. Right. Amen. All the devices that men are trying are simply not working. We are going downhill, not uphill. We are not improving. We're getting worse instead of getting better. And we can look at it. It's not for me to look at that Bible and say, that, so that's barbaric. Let me know my God. Let me understand the nature of His righteousness. And then I can understand that this is justice. This is holiness. And it's the only way you can control evil. In a society where men are permitted to have free will and a tempter and they can possibly sin. You must have a punishment that will deter the crime. Because men are either, when they're unselfish, they're either going to be motivated by a desire for reward or a fear of punishment. And you've got to have enough there to, so that it makes it rewarding for them not to do it. Or you've got to have something there to put enough fear in them to keep them from doing it. Because there is no love. Once you get men motivated by love, it's not a problem. Because love will fulfill the will. You don't have to hold a punishment over their head. If you're a saint of God, I don't need to hang hell over you. I don't need to hold some kind of death penalty and fret over you. No, because you love God and you'll do it because it's written in your heart but if you don't love God then I've got to give you some incentive in order for you to do good or I've got to threaten you with some kind of punishment if you don't do what is good and that's the only thing that's going to keep men going but God would do that during the millennium and understand this our God's standard is a righteous standard and I want to live and abide by that standard I have to watch over who I am you have to watch your life. And I just want to try to get it down into your, in your, your mind and your spirit. Watch, watch, watch. Yes. Have you found yourself that lately you're indulging in something? Have you picked up any bad habit? Have you become addicted to something? Is there, how is your spirituality? Are you happy? Hello? Are you in victory? Is there joy in your life? Do you go to church ready to worship? 
or are you down and defeated? Oh, well, I'll get over it. You're not being watchful and you're not being prayerful. Because I'm telling you, it's your flesh. You can sit there and make your determination all day long. You can sit there and say, I'll beat it. I'll get over it. I'll conquer it. And it eventually will pass. Your flesh is weak. It'll overcome you. It'll overcome you. better watch. Are you going uphill or down here? Is life progressing or regressing? Are you getting closer to God? Or are you getting farther away? How is your prayer life with the Lord? When you kneel down and pray, is there everything clean between you and the Father? Do you have the Father's best interest at your heart? Do you feel when you talk to Him? You can talk to Him without any hypocrisy. You can speak to Him and be open and honest about everything that you are. You've got nothing that you want to hide from God. You've got nothing that you're trying to, when you kneel down to pray, you don't put on any show before God. It's just naked truth right before Him. Here I am, oh God. And when you tell God, when you tell God that you love Him, is it really real? Does it really have value? Does it have meaning from Lord? Is it just words? Is it just honoring Him with your lips, but your heart is far from Him? I'm telling you right now. You say, I'm seeking. I'm getting close. What are you doing? What is going on in your life? What kind of prayer life do you have? What kind of relationship? How would you rate your relationship with God right now on a scale of 1 to 10? Oh, I don't know how to do that. Well, how would you relate your relationship with your wife? How would you relate your relationship in your home? Because I'm going to tell you, oftentimes our earthly relationships are a factor and function of our heavenly relationships. Look, folks, this is life. It's in the game. That's right. It's in WPC. It's in Church of God. It's in Assembly of God. This is salvation. Amen. Watch and pray that you enter not in a temptation. Watch, watch, watch. Keep your eyes open. Do you find yourself having a quick temper? Do you find yourself getting out of losing control quickly? Do you find yourself being impulsive and spending impulsively? Do you find yourself easily irritated? Do you find yourself, you're just being complaining and you lack a joyful spirit and you've got a complaining, bitter spirit? I'm telling you that that's watching. You can't pray about something you don't know is there. You can't take it to prayer unless you see it. You can't take it to prayer unless you realize it's going on. You've got to be honest with yourself. You've got to look about it. And you've got to say, hey, it's there. I see it. I've got a need. It does no good. We can all just have the professed humility and modesty. Well, I know I've got problems. I know I've got my issues. But but you've got yours. That's not going to work. Because we do nothing about our issues. If I know i got issues, what am I doing about my issues? Yeah. And my, what, what effect is it having upon me? What effect is it having upon Brother Woods? And I've seen that. Even the trial recently. And this year I had to look in my own life. Hey, this thing is, is getting me that it's starting to affect me. I don't need that. I need to put this thing in the hands of God and move on. This thing is starting to make me where, you know, it wants to just enter in on everything that I do. This is not what's supposed to be here. And Brother Woods has to put it aside and say, no. That's not going to be that way. That's not going to come into my house. That spirit's not going to happen. Many times we don't see the early warning signs. We're not watchful over our families. Like we need to be watchful, but always there looking, watching, and constantly watching for attitudes. If I see my daughters and their attitudes not right, why is that there? Why are they being disobedient? It's those little things. Listen to me, young people. You get a little older, you get a little more mature, and you think, oh, well, hey, mom and dad, I'm not seven and eight anymore. You don't have to treat me like that. They won't treat you like seven and eight when you don't act like it. And you will never convince a wise parent that you're not seven and eight by screaming and yelling and declaring that you're not seven or eight. You will convince your parents when you act your age. When you act responsibly and maturely. Amen? It's the same way with God. That we act as we are. But it starts with that little bit. Well, I'm older now, you know. They ought to just let me go. Hey, wait a second. They're your parents. They're always your parents. They're always an authority in your life. And if they ask you something to do something, it's in your power to do it. 
doesn't cause you to go against God's word or doesn't cause you to have to shun if you're married and doesn't cause you to have to shun your marital responsibilities and your family duties that you have also there that take priority. You should do it. I learned that too late in life. I shamed my mom and my dad sometimes growing up. And I look back and see what a fool I was. Things I was ignorant of and naive, but it was still wrong. But I sought as I learned. I sought. It didn't matter if I was 45 years old. If my daddy said, son, do this. I made every effort to obey him and do it right then and there. If my mama tells, son, do this, I will do it for her and do it right then and there because that's the example that I set before my own children. I'm just telling you, it starts out with that little resistance, that little discontentment with your authority. And that little discontentment discontentment breeds rebellion. It breeds in a little while. It's become, I know better. It's become, I can do it better by myself. And that spirit opens a door wide for the enemy to come into your life and destroy you. Temptation is what it is. And you weren't watchful over it. And you allowed the spirit to come in and because I know better I can do it don't tell me no I am old I'm grown up now you're playing the devil's game don't do it don't do it don't play that game let's talk about this praying a little bit so I'm talking to you about watching look see what you're doing Make it a point to look over your life. Make it a point to evaluate yourself. Judge your own self. Gauge your own spirituality. Gauge your prayer life. Be concerned if you're not feeling God like you ought to feel Him. Be concerned if you haven't heard the voice of God for some time speak to you. Be concerned if Brother John's leading singing and, and you're not feeling nothing. It's not ministering to you. Be concerned when the Word of God is preached and it's not touching your heart. It's not awakening something inside you. It's not witnessing to your very spirit. Be concerned and watch and say, I've got to do something here. Praying. I want to just talk about four things in this scenario. First of all, the habit. Prayer has got to become a habit. A good habit. There are some habits that's good. And I don't care how often you do them, they're just good. Brushing your teeth is a good thing. I, it just makes good sense, you know. Uh, washing your hands, washing your body is a good thing. It just makes good sense to do it. And it makes good sense to have a regular habit of doing it. Yes. And so, with Jesus, what, what's that got to do with this context? Jesus, I do not believe, went to Gethsemane expecting the battle. The, one of the gospel writers tells us, that's how come Judas knew how to go there because Jesus often went there. He was just going to a place to pray and spend some time. He knew what was coming. It's because that was his habit. Before Jesus ever faced a major decision, before He ever faced a major event, He spent time in prayer before God. Before He ever anointed and called the apostles, He spent a night in prayer before God. Other events, when He was when He was really being tempted to go this way or that way, He spent a night in prayer before God. And there was this habit of always praying and, and, and spending time and knowing that di- difficult duties, difficult decisions, things that were coming up, He learned to develop a habit of prayer. And many times uh, we fall into temptation because we go seasons. We pray for a while and then we quit for a while. We pray for a while and we quit for a while. And there's no consistency in our prayer life. Uh, I'm telling you, an inconsistent prayer life will make you an easy target for the devil. Hello? Jesus had a consistent prayer life. The second thing is first resort. Jesus says... I'm feeling overwhelmed. I'm feeling exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Now, he did ask the apostles to watch with him, but he didn't say, hey, we better sit down and analyze this thing. He didn't say, come on, fellas, sit down and talk to me a little bit. I, I'm feeling really bad. Come on, cheer me up. You know what he did? He went and fell on his face and talked to Father. Because with Jesus, first resort is to talk to Father before you talk to anybody else about it. Amen. 
He made mention of it to the apostle, said, watch with me, but I'm going to go talk to Father. That was his first resort. Ask Father. See what Father says about it. Let's go to Father. i got a battle. Let's talk to Father. Prayer must not be our last resort. It must be our first resort. We've said it a hundred times, but that's just the way it is. With Jesus Christ, it didn't matter what he faced, he prayed about it. Yes, sir. He goes to Lazarus' tomb and he said, I thank you, Father, that you've heard me. Oh, yeah. He prayed about it. It was there. It was his first resort. It didn't matter what it was. Whatever was there, that was the first thing. If he got overwhelmed, if a need came, I'm telling you, he went to God about it. But what we oftentimes do is we don't pray until we've exhausted every other resource and every other avenue. And prayer is our last resort instead of our first resort. Prayer must be your first thing. Thirdly, intensity. And the intensity of your prayer, the intensity of your prayer is often tied to the petition. If the petition is great, the intensity will have to be greater. It will have to be as great, I should say, but it will have to be greater than normal. There's sometimes we wonder because we sit down and we pray for certain things and we, we prayed 15 minutes and we got an answer. And then sometimes we prayed 15 hours and still haven't got an answer. But sometimes there's more things at stake. I'm telling you what was at stake here was our salvation. What was at stake here in the Garden of Gethsemane is Jesus completing the destiny and fulfilling the obligation that He came to this earth to do and finishing His course. Everything was at stake. Everything was hinging on that Garden of Gethsemane. And I will tell you, there's a lot hinging. We need to see miracles in this church. We need Brother Doug to be healed. It's for numerous reasons. It's not just for one reason. It's for several things. And that's why the prayer must be more. It must be more intense. And that's why he's praying. He is in agony. He is in a bitter conflict and he's praying until you can hear it. It's not seeing it, you can hear it. I've mentioned it, but I say it again. You can hear it drop off of his body and hear the sweat going with a dull thud into the earth. What what density was there? What an intense agony that is taking place. And I'm telling you, rarely have we even ever broken a sweat in a time of prayer. How long has it been since you even cried in a time of prayer? We pray and there's hardly even any emotion. And Jesus is agonizing with such groaning that His sweat can be heard hitting the ground. We don't like intense prayer. It's work. It's sacrifice. It's difficult. It's hardship, it's turmoil, it's toil. But I'm telling you, it will sometimes take that to overcome the temptation. Glory to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. Woo! Praise the Lord forevermore. Oh, I'm telling you, can I tell you tonight, this battle is worth winning. This battle is worth winning. Oh, I tell you, so much is lost when you fall, when people go back and it's happening all over our nation today. Folks are turning aside, they're backsliding, they're giving up, they're going liberal, they're going the other way. How much is being lost? Generations are being lost because every time I see somebody fall, it takes me one to dig in. I told my wife, every time I see somebody fail in the marriage, it makes me want to run to my wife. It makes me want to hold her. It makes me want to get closer to her. It makes me want to work more in my marriage and say, I want her to be strong. I should never look at others when they fail and say, oh, well, I, that excuses me. That excuses my fault. No, sir. Let me dig harder because I'm telling you, I want to show the world we can make it. You can live this life. You can overcome the tempter. You can live a holy, righteous life in the presence of God. You don't have to sin. Amen. You don't have to fall in the temptation. There's a way out. I close with this final point. I want you to read the verse because it ties to it. Hebrews chapter 5. I want you to go there. Verse 7. It speaks in the context of the priesthood and the Kingship of Jesus Christ. He's our priest. He's our king. In verse 7 of Hebrews 5 it says, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong 
crying and tears. The only event that can ever be connected to in Scripture is Gethsemane. Unto him that was able to save him from death. And that's what was happening in Gethsemane. He said, my soul is sorrowful unto death. Exceeding sorrowful even unto death. And was heard in that he feared. What was his petition? Father, save me from this hour. Save me from this death. And God heard him. Now when God hears him, he answers him. It means that God saved him from the death in the garden of Gethsemane. Strong crying and tears. When you sweat, if it's literally blood, but when you sweat and you can hear it hit the ground in the night, let me tell you something, that's strong crying and tears. You're agonizing. Right. He's on his face. He is weeping and crying before God. He is agonizing so much so that in his humanity, it requires an angel to come and strengthen him. Yes. That's how weak, that's how weird, that's how worn. But the point is this. He feared he didn't fear death. What did he fear? He feared God. That's why he's saying, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. He feared disobedience. He didn't want to disobey the Father. He didn't want to turn from the Father's will. He didn't want to go a road that he should not go. He feared God Almighty. And that's what you and I have got to have. Can I tell you something right here and now? What will keep us? By the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The reason that men become arrogant in their knowledge, the reason that men in the, in the medical arena, in the technological arena, they become arrogant, they become proud, they become lifted up they think they know it all, it's going to be their destruction but it's because they don't fear God can I tell you, until you fear God you know nothing, until you fear God you are a fool, I'm telling you only those who fear God are wise, and it's by the fear of the Lord that men depart from evil the Bible says, and that's what it's got to be, somewhere the reason that will keep us where we are is that inside of us there's a fear of God, I remember growing up I remember growing up as a young man, times, times that temptation would come to me, almost overwhelming. And sometimes I would come to such a point, close to the precipice, close to going over the edge, close to falling into an arena I shouldn't fall in. I'm going to be honest with you, Brother John. In those times, there was one thing that saved me. I truly feared God. Right. And it would grip me, Sister Gracie. What are you doing? You are throwing away something, son. You are going down the wrong road. And you know it will take you to destruction. And a fear of God would grip me. God should not be treated this way. I owe Him more than this. I cannot do this. And if I would back up. I would escape the snare. I would find the way out and find the way back to victory and the place of safety. But there's one thing that you've got to do, and one thing's going to keep you praying until you get the victory, and that is you don't want to disobey God. You fear Him, and you want to please Him, and you've got one goal in life, and that is to make sure that at the end of the day that God is happy with you. Maybe I've been repetitive. Maybe I've said things I know I've said before. But somewhere I think this is where you and I have got to dig, watch and pray. Yes. I believe God's given us some things here at this church that are wonderful. And we're not going to keep them because we have good preaching. We're not going to keep them because we have right doctrine. We're not going to keep them because we've got talents and abilities. We're going to keep them because we watch and we pray. Yes. Amen? Right. It's not watch and sing. It's not watch and preach. It's not watch and talk about it. It's watch and pray that you enter not the temptation. Spirit's willing. Flesh is weak. You need to know as long as you're in this unglorified body, you're a weak pot of clay. 
You are a clay pot, and your pot can crack any time unless you learn to rely on the one that indwells you and can say indeed, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Would you stand to your feet? Hallelujah. 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 I just felt one more time God wanted me to challenge this church. Watch and pray. Church, I'm looking at Brother Woods. I ask myself questions. Brother Woods, what's, where are you at here? Well, are you getting done what you need to get done? If a prayer hasn't been answered, why has it been answered? Why has it not been answered, by the words? And I'm asking myself, I'm talking to myself. Or I should say, I'm talking to the Lord about me. But are you watching? Are you being careful? In your times of weariness, in your times of victory, in your times of strength can be some of your most vulnerable times. When you feel the best can be the times when you're most vulnerable. Or when you feel the worst can be your most vulnerable times. Anytime your life is put in an extreme situation, you're vulnerable. But let me tell you something that God is able. And simple watching and praying can cause you to keep the victory and win over the tempter. How many want to win that battle? Would you pray with me right now? Father God in heaven, help us tonight. Father in God in heaven, help us tonight. Lord, I've just shared these simple thoughts that You've given to me. God, is my own experience in this Word, Lord, and what I've seen happen time and time again. I know times, Lord, in my own life when I failed God because I didn't watch and I didn't pray. I didn't watch. I didn't see it happening, Lord. I didn't watch that it became so gradual sometimes. It just overcame me. And oh, but Lord, thank You for waking me up eventually. Thank You for somebody, Lord, hitting me between the eyes. Thank You for somebody shaking me. Sometimes it was crude and rude. Sometimes, Lord, it shocked me. Sometimes, Lord, a message had to, had to, Lord, break me. But I thank You for it. I thank You, God, for shaking us awake. I thank You, God, for gripping us, Lord, and bringing us out of sometimes a deep slumber. And oh, Lord, I just pray it will help us to overwatch so we don't ever fall into that slumber. So we, Lord, are those that are constantly vigilant and awake. And we do not, Lord, fall prey to the snare of the fowler and the enemy. It's the only way we're going to survive. It's the only way we're going to make it. And I'm asking you to touch this church tonight. I'm asking you to grip their hearts, Lord, and help us to be a people, Lord, who never take, Lord, things for granted. Who never think we can make it, but we simply watch and pray. We simply watch and pray. And we're on the go. Because we live in a realm that's fraught with danger. We have a destiny to keep, Lord. The devil wants to detour us. We got a duty to be fulfilled. We got a treasure to be kept. And the enemy would have us lose it. Lord, he has shipwrecked of many a person. But we want to make it. We want to make it. We want to make it. And you have given us a plan. You've given us, Lord, a path to tank, and it's what we want to do. Help us. I can't do it without you, Lord. I can't do it without you. 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 Help us. Help us. Help us. I cannot preach. I cannot be a minister or a pastor. I cannot even be a husband or a father without you, Lord. I cannot be a friend or a brother without you. I cannot pray effectively without you. I cannot love others without you. I cannot do my work without you, Lord. Everything is, Lord, dependent on you. I need you more and more. Help us, God, to understand that that's the only way we're going to make it. Help us to be honest, Lord. Help us to be honest, oh God. Lord, let it not be that things are destroyed on our watch. Oh, hallelujah. This is our watch. This is our hour. Let this message... 
not fail to be preached on our watch, Lord. Let this holiness message not go, Lord, astray on our watch. No. May we keep, Lord, the banner high. May we preach it, Lord. May we not compromise it. May we not, Lord, yield one ounce to the enemy, one inch to the enemy. But may we hold the course, stay the course, and watch You, Lord, do Your work among us and be faithful to Your people. Hallelujah. Strengthen us, O God, tonight. Lift up this church. Encourage Your people. And Lord, wherever there has been a failure, let there be a return to You. And let Your grace and mercy come to us and lift us up and strengthen us so that we can accomplish the work that we need to do, I pray. Oh, in the name of Jesus. 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 Hallelujah. Glory to God. God, let us have the habit. Let's make it our first resort. Let us involve ourselves in intense prayer. And let us fear You in our times of prayer, God. Let us ever want to please You, Lord. Mm. Take nothing for granted. But trust You in all things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen.